Good afternoon to everybody and welcome to this uh, Bruegel event devoted to uh, green industrial policy. This is the last event uh, of uh, the year for Bruegel. It has been a very long year, plain full of, uh, of events uh, and uh, publications. So we are bringing it uh, to a close with uh, the official uh, launch of a new book that uh, was just published on the Bruegel website a few minutes ago, which is a blueprint uh, on a green industrial policy for Europe. Uh, we know, we have learned uh, over the last uh, uh, year or so, or so that uh, in order to be successful, the uh, European Green Deal uh, needs to turn decarbonization into uh, an industrial opportunity for Europe. Uh, this uh, brings uh, the issue of green industrial policy under the spotlight, but uh, as we will see in this event, this is a very complex issue. Uh, what is green industrial policy? What makes it different from uh, uh, traditional industrial policy? What are the principles and the tools around which uh, an EU green industrial policy can be uh, developed? These are the questions underpinning uh, our book that uh, Renita Wegelers uh, and uh, myself uh, had the pleasure to write uh, together over these, uh, over these last uh, months. Uh, we would like to acknowledge the support of the European Climate Foundation, by the way, for this publication, which we really invite you to, uh, to check in our website if you are uh, interested. With this event, uh, we will uh, first uh, see a presentation of this book by Professor uh, René de Wegelers, and then we will have the pleasure to also have uh, a conversation on this important topic together with uh, Anne Mettler. Anne is, uh, uh, of course, well known in, in Brussels and beyond. Uh, she is the director of Europe of uh, Breakthrough Energy. And formerly, she uh, was the head of the European Political Strategy Center. And uh, it is under her leadership, actually, that in March uh, 2019, the EPSC uh, published a seminal report uh, on uh, an industrial policy for the European Union. So we will have the chance to have have, uh, her insight on this important topic. But uh, voila, without much further ado, let me give the ball immediately to Renilde for the presentation of the book. Renilde, the floor is yours. Yes. Thank you, Simone, for a very, very uh, good presentation. I will try to keep uh, the presentation of the, of the book as short as possible because uh, I'm, I'm definitely also looking forward to discussing uh, with Anne and learn from her, from her uh, experience and expertise. Um, let me try to share my screen on this. Um, oh, wait, wait, wait. So, oh, okay. So, all oh, windows. One second. <laughs> Do you see my screen now? Not yet. Not yet. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me go again. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, I'm sorry. I hadn't opened the PowerPoint presentation, <laughs> which was bad. Uh, Maybe so you can open it in presentation mode. Well, voilà, perfect. That's perfect. Voilà. Yeah. So uh, first of all, uh, this is um, uh, has been uh, become quite a substantial contribution, and uh, would take too much time if I would go into too much detail uh, here. So I'm going to try to really focus on the most essential ones, very briefly defining green industrial policy, what's different, um, then trying to come up with some kind of insights from based on on the literature, the academic literature, and case studies that we examined, what the basic um, recommend what the basic uh, characteristics should be of a new green industrial policy. And then we will check those principles with what we currently have at the EU to come up with, which is the most important part, with some uh, recommendations for EU policy uh, making uh, here. Uh, in terms of the introduction of why uh, green industrial policy is necessary, Simone already made that very clear. Uh, so because it's such a, a very substantial, big transformative change that's needed, both for business and society, uh, it will be very important to make sure that we create enough winners 
uh, for the uh, European Green Deal to have um, to have this as a, as a sustainable policy. And that's why we need also the industrial policy aspect to create enough winners to turn this into a sustainable policy uh, here. Um, but indeed, uh, as also Simone already mentioned, uh, green industrial policy, what is this actually uh, here? So I think it really needs to be defined and particularly why it would be different from traditional industrial policy on the one hand and on the other hand, from climate change and the Green Deal uh, itself. So the way in which we actually see this is you have these two components, climate policy, which has as its focus decarbonization, industrial policy that has as its focus um, social welfare improvement, sometimes a bit more narrowly defined only in terms of competitiveness, but actually can, can be more broader in terms of social welfare. And what green industrial policy does is actually combine the two uh, here. So it has uh, as objective the same industrial policy objective of social welfare, but with, a, with the importance and binding constraints of decarbonization uh, here. And because it needs to to balance these three, these two objectives, it will be very specific uh, here. And it's the most important challenge of green industrial policy is how to balance these two objectives, particularly if these two objectives are not perfectly aligned. When we have to make choices, one versus the other, um, then of course it starts to matter how you, how you uh, balance these correctly here to the most efficient way uh, possible. And that also raises the question of what kind of instruments green industrial policy are we looking at? If it would just be or would it be just enough to combine the instruments that we typically are deploying for industrial policy and the, the instruments that we would be deploying for climate uh, policy, would that be enough? Or do we need to uh, identify new policy instruments or at least make sure that these various uh, existing policy instruments are properly uh, complemented here? So that's the, the, the main challenge of green industrial policy. So when we're looking at how that green industrial policy should look like, uh, we actually uh, want to use the insights from um, the discussion that has taken place in the academic community on how industrial policy in general should be developed and particularly the new industrial policy perspective. Why do we think that's important? Well, first of all, the new industrial policy helps the green industrial policy discussion because it starts with a much broader multi-dimensional set of objectives than classic industrial policy here. So it also it's not just about making sure you have more growth, more GDP, but also the quality of jobs and also the, the quality of growth also matters. So new industrial policy uh, really, because it emphasizes those multi-dimensional sets of objectives, is able to accommodate much better green industrial policy here, taking the, that multi-dimensionality multi much more explicitly into account. Uh, classic industrial policy also always has a discussion on, you have on the one hand, the need for intervention rooted in market failures, but there is also the whole discussion on government failures, uh, implementation difficulties here. And new industrial policy actually is not trying to say it's one or the other, it's really trying to combine as much as possible the need for uh, market intervention by avoiding as much as possible ex ante government failures uh, here. And that's why it actually looks at, rather than the classic industrial policy perspective of uh, we need to focus on tools to allocate resources, which sectors, do, which companies do we need to pick? How, how do we need to allocate funding? That's not the focus of the new industrial policy. New industrial policy really sees more its interventions as a, as a process rather than just a tool to allocate resources uh, here. Uh, and it's it really sees this process as one of an institutionalized collaboration, public-private partnerships between the government, the private sector, but also civil society. Uh, and civil society is also important in this aspect uh, here because it, on the one hand, will lead to legitimation, um, but will also be quite important because we need to mobilize civil society too for being able to implement uh, the, the policies uh, as well. So it's a much broader um, setting of, of um, 
collaborations than purely private sector, also civil society involvement uh, here. And it's, it's institutionalized uh, collaboration, but also at the same time that collaboration is really seen as a process of collaboration, which uh, with iterative um, um, uh, phases of collaboration and dialogue where we can continuously learn, improve, uh, also change uh, the, the setting of partnerships uh, here. Um, this whole process and seeing it as a process is important uh, to be able to, on the one hand, ad address the, the market failures uh, here, but at the same time also make sure that we avoid the government failures uh, here. So what this process uh, for new industrial policy also particularly emphasizes is, first of all, embeddedness, so making sure that private sector is involved. Um, private sector not only because they need to co-finance, but also because we need their capacities and we need also the information that each of these different players may actually hold. And that's why it's very important that they are embedded. Uh, they also are Im important because of course, in the end, they need to be incentivized uh, properly and they need to be willing to commit to uh, these incentives, uh, incentives and at the same time also in case of not, um, uh, not uh, reaching the targets, also the, the, the sticks uh, as well uh, here. So embeddedness is very important. Identifying targets, sticks, carrots, and milestones is very important. Um, not only because we want to have a, a continuous process of, of, uh, of, of trying to uh, incentivate the private sector, but also because we want to minimize um, uh, uh, rent seeking and, and, and political capture here by carefully designing these uh, these targets uh, here and these targets and sticks also uh, imply that uh, parties can be held accountable private sector but also civil society and also government here so the commitment got, comes along with accountability again very important to avoid rent seeking uh, and, and, and capture uh, here and of course also very important transparency uh, here um, transparency uh, and accountability combined with giving them enough independence uh, here to once the targets have been set, uh, that they can actually also constantly um, align and, and change their, their, their policy and actions here. So independence, transparency, accountability are very important points uh, here. What's also stressed by the new industrial policy is again, this learning mechanism. Um, is that we need to constantly take on board new information that comes available and, and adjust uh, here. Um, so that means a lot of experimentation uh, is, is at the heart of, of new industrial policy here. Uh, dynamic public-private partnerships here with new partners entering and, ex and some exiting uh, constantly is possible. And also competition among uh, the various um, uh, uh, entities here, because that competitive pressure will also uh, provide a good way of, of efficient uh, learning as well. So these are the new uh, insights from industrial policy, which we thought would actually be very helpful also for thinking about green industrial policy here. So as already said, why? Because, uh, because of the broader societal goals and, and how to really combine the different multidimensional aspects of green industrial policy. That's really why we need to have uh, this new industrial policy perspective. Also the fact that climate change is a big transformative change. We will need also public private partnerships will be very important uh, component uh, here and also the involvement of civil society. Um, but on top of that, what's also important to, to emphasize is the urgency uh, associated with climate crisis. And that means that we need to take actions, even if there is still quite a lot of uncertainty and, and a very high risk of failure here. A classic approach would perhaps say, because of the high risk of failure, let's not try to intervene. But the urgency really makes it very important that we intervene. And, and that, that means that we need to be able to deal with high risk type of environments and high uh, uncertainty here. And again, that's why this whole uh, emphasizing it as a process of a continuous learning uh, experimentation and risk sharing component of the new industrial policy is very important for uh, green industrial policy here. Um, the high risk of implementation failure is also uh, applicable for green industrial policy and perhaps even more because of the high informational constraints 
constraints uh, here. And on top of that, um, also because typically this needs a much longer time horizon, while politicians usually have a much shorter time horizon, and that could also be an extra uh, implementation failure here. And that's why you really need, again, this whole process of, of sticks and balances and commitments and, and, and multi-partner -part involvement to uh, minimize these implementation failures here. And also this independence of the policy uh, governance is also an important uh, issue to look at um, for green industrial policy. Particularly for stimulating green technologies, um, that requires even more directionality than, than we generally would look for in green technologies. Why? Because first of all, green technologies, uh, as, as has been shown in the literature, have, has actually much higher knowledge externalities. So they have much more important spillovers to other technologies, which if, and so they, that's why they would need a special uh, support here in order to make sure that you get all the social returns from these much more platform uh, larger broader applicable uh, technologies uh, here um, another important reason why we need much more directionality towards green technologies is because they often are still early stage have much higher risks much more information and coordination failures so particularly these new emerging green technologies are still um, having ecosystems that need to be developed and in that respect uh, will require particularly extra support in order to avoid any um, any failures uh, here and then a third final important reason why we need especially support for green technologies is because uh, they could be facing lock-in from, uh, from, from older um, dirty technologies, fossil-based technologies and their plant dependencies. Uh, and if, if they still have to compete with support for um, these fossil uh, technologies uh, here, uh, then of course that makes it even more difficult for them to develop. So in order to compensate for those, we would need extra support for green technologies uh, here. Uh, and then the final dimension that is also typically associated with uh, clean uh, and uh, with green industrial policy is that climate change is a, is a global commons problem with the emphasis on global. Uh, and that means that also um, national policies will, will not be able to solve all, all these um, uh, problems and we would need a coordinated multilateral multinational uh, involvement uh, here uh, which is also pretty specific um, so uh, rather than going into uh, the specific details of, of policies and also we looked at a lot of case studies of actual policy implementation uh, here, what we would actually like to look at immediately is uh, how we can actually um, set, uh, use this set of principles that we have derived to evaluate the policies at the EU level uh, here. So if we first look at what green industrial policy instruments we could find at the EU currently being de deployed here, and we where we basically uh, split this into, on the one hand, policies facing mm -hmm. innovation and technology, uh, secondly, investments and deployments of, of green technologies, and then more broader framework conditions. If we look at the EU, so at innovation and technology, that's basically our major instrument. There is framework programs, um, the Horizon Europe, uh, where particularly European Innovation Council, uh, the missions, and also the EU Innovation Fund are important uh, instruments. Of course, uh, that's only at the EU level. There is plenty of activities at the national level in terms of public R&D uh, spending um, and also at regional uh, level. Uh, the question is also partly how the EU can coordinate these, uh, these different uh, uh, programs or instruments at national and regional uh, level. If we look at investments and the deployment of, uh, of already uh, existing technologies uh, here, then of course we can um, activate a whole EU budget, next generation EU, uh, but also the European Investment Bank is a very important instrument uh, here. Uh, and uh, in terms of um, uh, more framework conditions, also all single market rules and particularly also green public procurement uh, would be also an important instrument at EU level for coordinating uh, investment and deployment. Uh, here. Uh, and again, of course, a lot of investment takes place at national and, and regional, particularly at regional, I'd like to emphasize the smart specialization strategies uh, here that emphasize also quite a lot uh, this, um, uh, this, this, uh, the clean component there. And again, it's, it's a question of how the EU can also coordinate um, and, and uh, look for possible synergies uh, 
uh, for these regional investments as well. In terms of framework conditions, quite a lot of instruments uh, apply it at the EU. Uh, first of all, an important uh, framework condition is how to coordinate the various um, uh, national and regional initiatives, as already mentioned, with, for instance, the, the instrument of European semester, but uh, also important framework conditions have to do with regulation and with competition uh, and competition policy. Uh, particularly from an industrial policy perspective, but also in general climate policy itself, uh, and particularly how it sets uh, green regulation, um, and as well as uh, clean uh, carbon pricing uh, with the ETS, uh, is a very important framework condition for stimulating uh, innovations uh, as well. Again, a lot of reg regulation also takes place at national and regional level and needs to be coordinated. That's a single market uh, agenda as well. And then in terms of the international dimension, I think that's also important. Uh, so the development policy uh, area, trade policy uh, is an important component too. So overall, there is a lot of instruments at the EU level um, um, that are being uh, activated and can be activated here but overall it's quite a multitude of policy initiatives on different layers uh, both in terms of competences and in terms of, of uh, geographic um, and clearly making the case of the need of coordination to ensure uh, a, a consistent policy mix here and to uh, to ensure also sufficient single market scale here a level playing field and avoiding conflicting uh, initiatives uh, here. so that's a major challenge of of the green uh, industrial policies um, if we go a bit more into detail of, of some of these most important industrial policies so we, we're highlighting a few of those uh, here so we think the european semester and the smart specialization programs are an important component uh, and through the european semester we can try to integrate the smart specialization program so we see that as a quite important um, instrument for coordination. Another important instrument uh, is the European alliances. Why? Because they really go for these public-private partnerships that we have addressed, our, that we have already uh, shown how important they will be for uh, climate change, uh, green industrial policy uh, here. Um, so these public-private partnerships, of course, at the EU level have the uh, subsidiarity uh, issue here, and so they will be uh, cross-border value chains in technologies uh, here. So we have on batteries, we have on clean hydrogen here, but we think that that's really uh, a, an important uh, instrument to be looked at in, in future too. These European uh, alliances uh, are also important because associated with them are important projects of common European interest, which allow the different member states to to help fund uh, these initiatives here. So that's another important component here. For innovation policy- If I may, if I may we have five yeah. minutes. So that's if you want to come to the recommendations. Uh, For innovation policy, yeah, the rise in Europe is a very important uh, instrument. There's a lot of money here um, where uh, the, the currently uh, about one third of that will be devoted to. So quite a lot of, of money, uh, but again, two important uh, instruments there are the missions because again that's this public private and an also involving civil society type of collaborations uh, here so that's an important instrument that can be used that looked at and also the e eic accelerator is an important instrument according to us because that uh, will actually be able to allow the, the quite still quite risky type of uh, innovations uh, in, in, in europe uh, here so um in terms of let me go to to really the the policy recommendations that we have, uh, starting from what we already have, have and also with the relatively new, uh, even more ambitious uh, um, goals set by, uh, by the European Commission uh, here. So what we actually want to do is actually try to build this into a much more systemic, coherent green industrial policy. And for that, we have actually highlighted eight principles. Um, I'm not going to go into the details of all the eight principles because you cannot do that in four minutes <laughs> here. So let me very quickly say, of course, because it's so challenging to coordinate so many different layers and so many instruments, governance will be very critical uh, here. And that's why we spent quite a lot of time on how that governance of EU policy should be, uh, should be monitored. That has been always a weakness at the EU level here and explains why it always remains uh, all individual, unconnected and uncoordinated here. So the Coordination really requires this governments here. We go quite far in, uh, in suggesting governance structure here, including uh, having a, a tsar on this as well. So that will help definitely tackling this geographic uh, uh, fragmentation uh, here. 
Um, what we also still want is, is making sure that the long-term expectations are managed with a very strong decarbonization trajectory. So that's the link with the European Green Deal and with uh, climate change policies uh, here. But of course, from a policy perspective, we really want also these public-private partnerships. That's why we want these alliances uh, to be further developed here. But uh, really further developed along the principles that we have uh, highlighted before following from this new industrial policy perspective. So they should be much more addressing mega problems rather than very small components like, for instance, the batteries here should have a much broader set of, of, of actors here with different parts of the value chains uh, here, a much more uh, balanced uh, mix also of not just only helping to push what's already uh, already connected but needs to be scaled up, uh, what's, what's now very often the case, versus really very early stage emerging value chains that still have to be developed. Uh, uh, in terms of green investment, of course, we're very happy with the higher uh, EU budget for that, uh, but we want to make sure that that's clearly monitored, that it's really green uh, here, so we need to have a, a methodology for monitoring better climate change uh, spending here. We're also very happy about the European Investment Bank, but still we want that also to be upscaled and actually be used much more as a development bank. Again, also uh, as a smart green development bank in order to make sure that it can play its role in these public-private partnerships here to make sure that networks are being formed, that information is being exchanged here as well. So more that role and not just only about uh, providing funding uh, here. Um, so again, in terms of green science and innovation very happy with the higher uh, part of the horizon budget for for clean here um, more emphasis on the missions but again much more with the principles of um, uh, as, as we identified uh, here and with much more emphasis on the risky early stage clean uh, technologies uh, projects here so trying to to uh, avoid the risk uh, risk um, bias that there might actually be in terms of global approach uh, again want to push further the role of the of Europe uh, on, on the global scene here taking up uh, this vacuum in global leadership yes we can I think and finally transparency of course is very important it's so important and the name need less words to just uh, finish uh, here. So thanks a lot for your attention. Very much looking forward to the discussion here. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Renilde. Of course, uh, uh, condensing a book into 10-15 minutes is not easy, so uh, thank you very much for, for the effort. Uh, again, the book is available in the Google website, so feel free to download it if you wish. Uh, if you want to ask uh, uh, questions uh, to our panelists, uh, uh, let me remember that uh, uh, it is possible to go to Slido, slide.com. Do. And using using the hashtag green, you can write uh, your questions to the panel. But before moving to the question and answer, we have the uh, now the insights from Anne on uh, uh, what is her take on green industrial policy. Anne, the floor is yours. Okay, so I unmuted myself. Can you see my slides? Yes, but we see. We, also, we, we, your notes. And <laughs> okay. Hold on. Caring so, a bit too much. Yeah, okay. <laughs> now we only see the word. So, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. So, maybe I will just uh, stop. Uh, hold on. I'm sorry. Uh, let me do stop share. No, no, I'm, um, I'm happy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, these are always the moments you love. Oh, hold on, share screen. Yeah, but it's nice to know that uh, you are not the only one. <laughs> so, hold on, hold on. Um, but uh, in the meantime, we can enjoy the Christmas tree so, behind Renilde that uh, brings us into the, the spirit, uh, the spirit of the period. Um, and, uh, yeah. Voila. That's, that's still not right. That's still not right. That's not all right. Uh, I, that's why we were told to close all the. All the other. Uh, now, now, now. Hold on. Because I also realized that now that's. <laughs> it, it should now work. Let me see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How exactly. is this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay? Perfect. Yes, perfect. Yes. Okay. Thank you. So, hold on. This, is it fine? Yeah, it's fine. Yes. Before? Okay. So then. 
uh, first of all, thank you for the introduction and, and congratulations on your, your blueprint, uh, Simona and Reinhilde. I think it's really, it's great work. Uh, as you said, Simona, I spend a lot of my time thinking about EU industrial policy, so not necessarily green industrial policy, of course, there are huge overlaps. So, I mean, I think the fact that your book's coming in at, a, at 100 pages says a lot about the complexity and the challenge of what we are trying to, uh, to achieve here. And I thought in my remarks, I speak a little bit about my, my current perspective. I now, um, I'm, I'm sort of deeply embedded in uh, clean technology innovation have many opportunities to speak to investors, to entrepreneurs. Uh, and uh, and uh, so I thought I, I maybe come at it a little bit from, from this perspective. Um, and, um, and that's why I, I really want to take my time here today to, to zero in on the development and deployment uh, challenge that Europe has. And I always go back to what, um, what uh, President von der Leyen actually said when she first introduced the European Green Deal, because it was so perfect. She said, this is Europe's man on the moon uh, moment. And, and that really so encapsulated perfectly sort of the embrace of science and discovery and uh, the ambition to achieve something very difficult. Um, I think you're doing a great job in the blueprint to essentially say that this is a, a transition of a magnitude that no none of us has ever really lived through. So this is huge what's going to happen in the coming decade in particular when we need to get many of these, uh, of these technologies uh, off the ground. And in that sense, and I think also here that uh, President von der Leyen has been very clear, the Green Deal is now the EU's new economic policy. It's now our new economic strategy. So it's absolutely correct uh, that we need to have this green industrial policy, and it's actually coming at an, at an uh, exciting time. Um, there's something I think that all of us sense, namely that we're on the cusp of a new technology revolution. And that's the clean tech revolution. And let me say that for me as a European and as someone who's really spent uh, almost two decades of my life uh, following the, the digital uh, technology revolution, I am absolutely committed to making sure that in this next technology revolution, the clean technology revolution, that Europe will play a leading role. And uh, that's uh, extremely important to me. Uh, first and foremost, for the climate, I mean, you make that point, uh, Reinhilde, but also because I believe that Europe needs to build a new foundation for economic prosperity. Because what we're living through at this moment in the midst of this pandemic and in view of the hundreds of billions of euros that are going to be spent, uh, both through the MFF, but particularly through the various recovery programs uh, from COVID-19, I think it's not an exaggeration to say that this is a once uh, in a generation opportunity to really make sort of build back better more than, than a slogan. I mean, we really have the opportunity to do that now. So in that spirit, uh, I wanted to share with you just four key points that I want to add to the debate and that I think are extremely important. Reinhilde, by the way, you mentioned most of them, but I want to highlight them a little bit now from my perspective. First of all, it's speed. A typical innovation cycle, which you see uh, here on my screen, takes around 25 years, 25 years um, or even longer. That's sort of from the early R&D phase to full scale commercialization and cost parity or even cost advantage vis-a-vis -a, -vis a competing highly emitting technology. And uh, this is uh, based on our previous experience with solar, which is what I'm showing you here. Um, and uh, where the R&D actually started as early as 1976. That's when the R&D started, but cost competitiveness was only achieved very recently. And it is precisely this trajectory that I'm showing you here that we really need to speed up. We don't have 25 years to develop uh, these, uh, these uh, technologies anymore. And with a particular focus, and this is why I highlighted here, to that middle part, which we describe as the deployment funding gap. Huh? 
this is a very critical period in the development of new technologies. It's a moment when government uh, uh, funding typically slows um, after the initial R&D phase, yeah? So, uh, and the private sector, however, is not yet willing to take on the technology risks. And policy support is often insufficient because there are few or no instruments uh, to facilitate validation and uh, demonstration projects. So that period here in solar, you, you see, it took 12 years to overcome this deployment gap. And I'm spending a lot of my time thinking about how can we accelerate uh, that period here? Because it is possible, uh, but we really need to zero in on what is needed in that particular phase. So the fact that it has taken us this long, the result is well known. Europe tends to be strong on discovery and invention but significantly less strong in deployment, scale, and innovation. And that's why I would like us to look at this char chart here and, and, and make us understand that we are responsible for the entire value, the uh, innovation cycle, and not just the first part. And I like to call this the three Ds, discovery, deployment, and diffusion. Huh? So we need to cover the entire innovation cycle and not just that first part around discovery because we will turn Europe into the world's incubator if we do this. And we know that a lot of companies are coming to Europe because we have the good research, we're doing all of this extremely well, but we can't scale and we can't deploy. And this has to stop. So this is something we need to zero in on. So I spoke about speed, I wanna talk about scale. Some of you uh, may have seen a recent blog uh, by Bill Gates. Um, in it, he introduces the idea of what we call a green premium. That's um, essentially sort of like a green surcharge. In uh, essence, the difference between a cost, the cost uh, between a product that involves emitting carbon and an alternative that doesn't. Um, and you see here in, in different uh, technologies, that the cost differential can actually be quite, um, quite considerable. And this uh, sort of poses a chicken and an egg problem because we need to bring down the technology costs for demand to accelerate, but demand will remain weak as long as the technology costs are so high. And while we think about all this and how to square the circle, can I also say that what compounds the challenge of bringing down the green premium or this green surcharge is that we're not faced with typical market dynamics here. We're talking about end products that are virtually impossible to distinguish many times with the only difference being that one is really more expensive. So can we really expect consumers to pay twice as much for carbon neutral steel versus carbon intensive steel. So these are issues that, uh, in my opinion, should be absolutely uh, the focus of this green industrial policy. Huh? And, uh, and that's why I'm sharing it today. So I spoke about speed, I spoke about scale. Now I wanna talk about demand and the value chain. On demand, I wanna show you this slide. So this slide was actually produced by Material Economics, which is a Stockholm-based energy consultancy that wrote an excellent paper um, that we commissioned on how to mainstream uh, green hydrogen in Europe. Now, I won't explain the entire uh, slide, um, um, but I want to zero in on a key point here under enabling um, a policy. And uh, the point is um, that to, uh, to consider increasing the ambition of European and member state uh, targets, focusing, it, focusing them on demand instead of just focusing on production targets. You know, oftentimes we have just these production targets without really saying how we're going to get there. Huh? So, so the, the point is that so much of what public policy does focuses on either these production targets or on supply. So we have supply for good research, we have supply of grants, of subsidies, et cetera. But what about if we spend more time actually organizing the demand through arranging buyers clubs for clean technologies, 
reviewing public procurement rules and maybe making them more green and also facilitating off-taker agreements. There's so much that could be done. And if we strengthened the demand, we would dramatically de-risk investments in these technologies. So think about demand. And finally, the value chain. Just to show you very quickly, this slide, which was also produced by Material Economics, you see here the slide, the example is Northvolt, uh, which is the company that has really put Europe on the global map when it comes to the production of batteries. And uh, Northvolt is, of course, also an integral part in, uh, of the, the Battery Alliance, uh, which has been very well managed, by the way, the Battery Alliance by EIT Inno Energy. And you see here in the middle part how transformational some of the early off-taker agreements with VW and BMW were to secure funding and then driving the scale up of the company. Yeah? So these offtake agreements were absolutely critical. And it's very important that with these new alliances that the commission has now launched on clean hydrogen, but also on critical raw materials, that it also adopt this approach of covering the entire value chain. Yeah? This is really important and driving the actual demand and not just the supply. Huh? So I cannot emphasize that enough. And uh, uh, you know, in closing, I just want to briefly say that uh, Breakthrough Energy's Europe operation is really, I always say to everyone, you know, we are here to help Europe achieve its ambitious uh, climate uh, goals. If we want Europe to succeed, uh, my boss, Bill Gates, he looks to Europe uh, with admiration, with inspiration. And, uh, you know, so we spend a lot of our time over here thinking, how can we generate demand for these clean technologies? How can we get the best ideas out of the labs and into, you know, brilliant startups? And how can we create a pipeline of clean tech projects that can scale globally. I mean, you're right, uh, Reinhilde, when you say this is a global challenge. Huh? So we need to look at our development policies, trade policies, everything. It's very complex, but I have no doubt that it can be done and that Europe is really in pole position to lead the world here. And uh, with that, I just wanna wrap up and say that I'm very pleased to be at this last event before Christmas and, uh, you know, wonderful to talk to you today about uh, all of these important issues. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Anne, for, for, this, uh, for this presentation. Uh, I think we, we share and need an idea, the idea that uh, we have today a once in a generation opportunity to really unlock uh, uh, this green transition and uh, this is why industrial policy is at the core of, of this issue. Uh, your four pillars, uh, speed, scale, demand and value chain, uh, I think uh, we agree on them and uh, somehow uh, some of them are also uh, developed uh, indeed in, in, our, in our book. Now, uh, we have, uh, uh, in the meantime, as uh, the presentations uh, were going, uh, collected uh, a number of questions on Slido. Again, uh, anyone that wants to do um, a question, uh, please just go to Slido and with the hashtag green, uh, feel free to do so. If you uh, allow me, I would then uh, just pick up some of these questions that are really interesting in order to, to have your thought on, on them. The first uh, uh, from Anonymous uh, says, uh, public investment is important, but massive private investment is needed. What is green industrial policy role in helping companies build viable business case for projects in the EU? Uh, Renilde, do you maybe want to start and then we go to Han? Okay, so that's, that's the big question <laughs> that we want to address uh, here. Um, and, but. The, the question already makes it very clear that it's not just about, okay, how much public funding are we spending? Uh, that's not the issue. That's a very classic approach here. It's really how we can leverage, use the public, uh, all the tools of public, uh, uh, public instruments, not just only funding, but also others like regulation, like carbon pricing, like procurement. Um, so all these instruments, how we can use them in order to leverage the private uh, investments here and not just only private investments but also the 
also the behavior of, of, of the final consumers uh, and, and citizens as well uh, here. So it's really using the public uh, resources and instruments, the whole bunch of it, uh, and uh, in order to leverage private businesses as well as, as, as citizens uh, here. And so that's why this, this public, private, um, and, and, and civil society uh, partnerships are so important. And why it's also so important to have a whole mix of policy instruments at the same time, and not just only focusing on how much money are we spending here. It's really all the different components and how they are coordinated. Um, and, and perhaps to make that point even more clearly, uh, I would also like to, um, to answer a bit to what Anne also mentioned in terms of the need for speed and time. And how, like for instance, in the initial phases of discovery, there's lots of public investments. Uh, so their grants and, 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 and uh, tax credits and whatever will be very important. But then we enter into the whole phase of deployment and of diffusion, where these instruments seem to be less important. Um, but that's not to say that public intervention will, import, will be important also to drive these forces uh, and phases as well. But that's then very often with other instruments, like with regulation, like with setting standards, like with, with carbon pricing, in order to make sure that there are enough incentives for the private sector uh, to be going for deployment uh, and, and adoption of technologies uh, here. And that's why looking at what kind of policy interventions. It's not just only grants that will be important for the first phases, perhaps less important for the second one. Other instruments will be becoming more important for the later phases. And a commitment to uh, a consistent policy mix throughout the whole cycle for a long enough time period, that's really uh, critical. Thank you, Renilde. Anne? Can I just come in? Yeah, thank you. So the first thing I have to say, and what I've learned uh, go, look, comparing sort of digital tech and clean tech innovation, there is a much bigger role for uh, public um, investment in clean tech innovation, because what you're seeing here is in order to take these technology and put them into an environment where you can deploy them and test them and validate them, you're talking about the kinds of money that, that no startup can really uh, muster. So, so there really is a big role here for um, uh, public investment. But as I said before, I mean, soon, sooner or, you know, or later, we're going to be awash in all this uh, recovery uh, uh, funding that's going to be uh, that's going to be spent. And um, I actually want to, without naming names, I want to say that um, my boss is uh, interested and willing to invest significant amounts of money in Europe. And I was recently told by sort of an economic type policymakers that what interests them about working with us is not so much the money, but the expertise that we have. Because what you have to understand is that clean technology innovation, you need a deep expertise in science. Uh, you know, so, so a lot of our team are PhD scientists, uh, embedded in uh, teams of investment managers, uh, business experts, uh, policy experts. So this is, and, and, and this person was very frank about saying what interests us actually much more is this expertise that you have that frankly, you know, no one in the public sector to that extent will, will, will have it, you know. And I think what the, what the private sector brings is not only money, but is also you know, they're not going to put their money into something that they don't think will work or won't be able to scale. And they so they bring a lot of skills and experiences uh, that that are actually as valuable as just the money. Yeah? And so I, I, I think that is important to, 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 to understand. But there is really huge scope right now for building a new generation of public private partnerships. I'm so glad that uh, Reinhilde and Simona, you pointed to this in your paper, because Neither the public sector can do this alone, nor the private sector. So this is really a calls for new ways of working one another. And uh, I hope in the next iteration, maybe we can hone in a little bit on how this can work in practice. Yeah, thank you, Anne. And indeed, uh, I think we also have a question on how can we structure these public-private partnerships in a way that, for example, we avoid the risk of, uh, of political uh, capture 
uh, that as we know and we have also flagged in the, in the book is a, a concrete uh, risk when it comes to uh, to industrial policy initiatives uh, in general so this will be the first uh, maybe question for the second round which uh, i might also uh, group with another question that is trending and relates to the impact of uh, um, digitalization now we are discussing, of course, the green side of industrial policy, but uh, as also the uh, new industrial policy uh, strategy of, Mar of last March has shown, uh, there is a dual uh, challenge uh, facing Europe. One is the green transition and the other is the digital transition. So how do you see the interplay, perhaps, of, uh, of these two uh, aspects? Um, Renilde, do you want to go first? So now I realize why I should have been sharing you presenting because <laughs> I still... that, that was exactly the trick. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> yeah, I only discovered too late. <laughs> so on, on, on public private uh, partnerships and how to manage them, uh, again, indeed, uh, as also was uh, emphasized by Anne, this will be really very pivotal for any kind of uh, green industrial policy. Um, so what we like to emphasize here is also seeing these pu public private partnerships, not just as, okay, these are just ways to allocate funding. <laughs> That's not it. It's not about the funding. It should really be seen as a process of bringing together the various uh, stakeholders in terms of not only in terms of bringing together their, uh, their resources, which can be financing, but can also be resources in terms of, of knowledge and skills and the information that they are having. Uh, seeing that also as a kind of dynamics where, of course, along the way, there will be new information coming along, new capacities that will be needed uh, here. And that's why they have to be seen as sufficiently dynamic, um, where new players can come in, where a different public private partnerships can, can be formed along the, the, the development path uh, here. Um, that also helps, I think, really to make sure that the public-private partnerships are not just some kind of rent-seeking device, because that's, of course, also the danger here. But if you see them much more as dynamic and of also bringing in competences uh, here and also commitments from each of the partners uh, here, uh, commitments to uh, to the with sticks and carrots, uh, which will also make sure that uh, this is not just to, to attract money here, but is also building together uh, which is really the emphasis of these public-private uh, partnerships. And what I think is also important is that there is al always sufficient heterogeneity in these public-private partnerships here, that you have both on the, on the, on the public side, various components of policy making uh, here, but also on the private side, along the value chains, uh, going from, from uh, suppliers to, uh, to customers uh, here, uh, having uh, science, but also having civil society. And so each of these can also balance, balance uh, each other uh, here. So I think if you really design them carefully enough, you can really avoid all the rent seeking and, and really have them as powers and necessary powers uh, for, uh, for making sure that uh, you reach efficiently the targets uh, here, but also that at the same time also make sure that the whole transformation is actually embedded in your public-private partnership and, and that the, the important stakeholders uh, get uh, uh, will find a transition uh, a win uh, here. The digital one, I leave for uh, for Al. <laughs> Yeah. And, and the floor is yours. Good. I, I'll take the liberty of also very briefly answering the first one on the PPPs. Essentially, what is needed is massive amounts of risk tolerant patient capital. Yeah? This is what is needed in order to finance this energy transition. And um, so, for instance, my boss, Bill Gates, he started a fund in 2015, $1 billion. Um, um, that has a much um, longer time horizon than a typical investment fund. Uh, I will also say that our perspective is that not all of this will be done by traditional private sector funds, but also philanthropic um, funds. So that's we, we are prepared to, to contribute to that. Uh, we, we may need to go there because as I explained before, we are under so much time pressure that we cannot wait for every sort of market dynamic to play itself out. So I think we need we need capital that is non-return seeking and uh, that will be philanthropic uh, in nature. That's uh, on the PPPs. On digitalization, I wanna say that I started looking into 
what are sort of the energy companies in Europe that have successfully made the transition to being a sustainable company? All of them have been heavy users of digital technologies. Um, the most recent one I, I spoke to, they actually speak about themselves as a platform for energy services. There's a lot of interplay with digital, be it around grid modeling, be it around sort of using um, a, a data analysis to better understand where energy uh, consumption can be curtailed, et cetera. So there are many, many applications. The last thing I would say is that increasingly IT companies are offering these off-taker contracts that I spoke about before. So they become massive buyers of renewable uh, energy. And so that's not to dismiss that role that the, that the IT companies can play as well. Maybe, Anne, uh, since there is a question directed uh, um, to you and uh, is also related to this issue, I will seize the occasion of uh, presenting it. Uh, the question says, uh, a lot of uh, EU industry transformation hinges on uh, uh, much more renewable power at global, globally competitive prices. So how do you see Europe uh, faring uh, on this? Uh, how do I see that? I mean, I see that we essentially, you know, in my past life, I did a lot of work on global trends and the trend is towards electrification. I mean, this is the, 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 the economy of the future will be to a very large extent uh, electrified. That means we need to massively scale up renewables. I mean, I don't think that the problem is so much uh, cost competitiveness because they have already reached that. I mean, oftentimes now renewables are cheaper than fossil fuels. The, the problem in Europe is with, with really meeting the potential demand. I mean, we need, to, we need to start building all this capacity. And all the more so, sometimes it is really intriguing to me how we're making a really bold plea for uh, green hydrogen. But green hydrogen cannot be uh, realized without massive uh, um, uh, uh, additional investment into renewable energy. So, you know, this is the interplay between the technologies that you spoke about, Reinhild, you know, there are still over effects. So if we don't massively scale up renewables, we can forget about green hydrogen. I mean, so, so this is, there's complete interlinkage here. And, uh, and so I worry much less about the cost competitiveness of the renewables rather than our ability to really now massively uh, increase the deployment of renewables. Um, if I may, um, it is often said that uh, the EU single market uh, is a sort of uh, a treasury that we need to use more also for the sake of, uh, of an EU uh, industrial policy. Uh, and indeed, uh, when uh, Renide and I have looked into this issue, it is clear that uh, um, Industrial policy tends to remain also a national uh, issue. It is seen by governments uh, often as a uh, issue that really goes at the core of uh, national sovereignty. So um, what is, uh, uh, in your view, uh, the way that Europe can really undertake to overcome these uh, problem that uh, presents the current fragmentation in, uh, in, uh, in green industrial policies in Europe, how can we really try to move beyond uh, this, uh, uh, this approach and really unlock uh, therefore the potential of the single market to allow the synergies and the economies of scale that are needed to make, uh, uh, as Anne said, uh, uh, not only Europe an incubator of green companies, but then also allow them to flourish uh, in the European market. So maybe Anne in reverse order, Anne, if you want to go first and then Rene. Thank you. Uh, this is a very good question. Can I tell you from now speaking both to companies and many uh, sort of policy makers at the national level, what we are talking about here, de, de facto is no properly functioning EU single market. I mean, this is, you talk about a sort of industrial policy being a national competence, but so is for the most part energy policy. So I would really think about sort of incentives uh, to encourage cross-border projects, because for me, it's been really an eye-opener when you speak to people who do these sort of big hydrogen projects and you see the difficulty that they have, you know, 
bringing it from Portugal or, you know, I mean, just sort of something that you think this cannot be that complicated in Europe, but it is. Huh? Going back to digital and making that connection again, the reason why digital was able to take off so quickly is precisely because there wasn't a lot of regulation. Huh? I mean, there wasn't nothing. I mean, in many ways, we're dealing now with the fallout of the lack of regulation. However, I will say it did a lot to unleash that. Here, we have 27 different regulatory regimes, different industrial policies. It's complicated. I personally, if it's possible, I would make a lot of the recovery funding at EU level contingent on cross-border sort of projects and actually using that money to, to actively encourage to build a proper EU energy market. Because without that, forget about talking about scaling and all that. I mean, it, it won't happen. It cannot happen. Yeah, we actually would be a perfect match with important common uh, projects of common European interest and therefore the use of state exactly. aid to encourage uh, intra-European collaboration. Renide, do you want to have yeah. a like, final word on this issue? Yeah, Ms. indeed, just to confirm also what you've been saying, uh, I think what very often the policy perspective, that's where the regionalization takes place on the business side, they want to go for internationalization. And that's why I think it's also very important that in these public-private partnerships, we will have several of these regional and the EU also playing an, an, an additional component here, is trying to really also provide incentives for the regional and, and, and national policy levels, why it benefits them and their policy agenda to uh, join uh, EU projects here. And then sometimes small top-ups uh, can already be sufficient to provide that kind of incentive. The same for the IPSIS. There it's just the fact that you get a looser um, 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 state aid uh, approach is already sufficient as an incentive for national policymakers to join and to look beyond their regional uh, objectives uh, here. So definitely, I think that's that's the role that the EU can play. So. I think we can, <laughs> can exploit uh, you. And voila. So thank you. And uh, I think that with, uh, with this, we have come to, to the end of our time. And uh, uh, I think uh, uh, both Renil and I would really like to thank Anne for having uh, participated uh, to this, uh, this uh, launch event for the Bruegel Blueprint, a green uh, industrial policy for Europe that you can find in the Bruegel website. As we said at the beginning, this is the last uh, event of the 2020 series at Bruegel. So it is also the occasion on behalf of the whole uh, Bruegel family to wish to you all uh, a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Thank you again and uh, see you 